Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the session. A quick presentation of uh, uh, our speakers. Why we selected this topic? Uh, let's start from the colleague, which is farthest from me, Anatoly Zolotuchin, advisor to the president of the university, scientific uh, manager of the Russian oil and gas uh, Gupkin University. Uh, Boris Rodman, uh, director of the company Edmund and partner. Uh, Vyacheslav Pershakov, deputy director general uh, on Rosatom Innovation Management uh, Department. Artur Chirengalov, special representative of the president of the Russian Federation for the Arctic Cooperation, a member of the Rosneft uh, Board of Directors. Alexander Chadaev, Vice President of Alrosa Innovation uh, Board of Directors. And I'm happy to introduce our expert, which is Adolf Lohmann. Two minutes to explain why we selected Arctic uh, as our topic. Many professionals maintain that Arctic development is much more complex and complicated than to actually explore outer space. According to the geology assessment made by the United States of America, Arctic is home to 90 billion barrels of oil and about 400 million uh, cubic meters of gas. 25% of uh, unexplored resources in the world. 1.5 times more than in Saudi Arabia. Russia is home to about half of the Arctic resources. Uh, our sector is home to the richest resources of oil and gas. The Arctic offshore area will be supportive of 2025 uh, extraction of uh, Russian resources. Uh, you know, we expect the first uh, batch in 2018. Uh, Gazprom this year uh, has started writing uh, Arctic history because the first batch of oil from the Arctic uh, offshore sector uh, this year is the start of practical exploration uh, and development of the Russian uh, Arctic sector. What's so different of Arctic development? Which technologies uh, could be in high demand? And how to minimize the negative human impact on Arctic aquatic environment? Uh, and our first speaker will try to give us the answers. Uh, Mr. Pershikov, which is love. Uh, I'm giving you the floor. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, this is a very interesting, I would say, intriguing question because Ras Adam is not a client for new technologies because uh, I will be happy to answer this question. Uh, Ras Adam is a a technological company. Uh, we are developing nuclear technologies and we are looking at related sectors where uh, high technologies could be applied. Arctic for us is one of the uh, test areas where we would like to offer. Uh, our own technologies. And I would like to share with you some examples of how it could be done, uh, because this is a very specific area of application and the way we see it. Why there? Uh, why these technologies? Uh, 
So, Arctic development may be the biggest global project that Russia wants to tackle. Uh, I'm not talking about the mankind, uh, because mankind will be facing different challenges. For Russia, the global project is the Russian Arctic. Uh, it has the richest reserves of oil and gas, and we have examples like, for example, Chukotka, uh, Nord Nickel, any mineral resources. But the biggest challenge uh, we will be facing is how to provide energy resources, how to provide power resources there. We have now an interagency committee, and Ross Atom initiated this process. We invited the Ministry of Defense, other agencies, the regional development ministry, how to provide power, and how to tackle specific power supply and environmental protection uh, projects uh, to support the development programs. We are not clients. We are a technological company which tries to provide an answer how to make it happen. How our biggest clients are uh, gas manufacturer uh, will get our technologies into action. We involved quite a number of experts and we are trying to build a so-called earmark federal program to provide power supply uh, to the development projects in the Arctic. Uh, demand is very high. We already uh, communicated with Rosatom, Rosneft, Rostroy, and specific other companies. I mean, I could cite a number of other companies, like, for example, Lukoil, Gazprom, uh, because they are uh, trying to develop pre Razlomne field. Uh, first of all, this is a so-called nuclear-based power generation in low temperature because life in the Arctic, uh, it is there if, for example, uh, we have uh, good temperature, warmth. Uh, that's why for us, nuclear power generation is a totally new solution. We kept on discussing this approach for quite a number of months and years, and now very close to introducing this technology into uh, the Arctic uh, specific uh, vessel building. Uh, we are present in many other sectors because you know quite a bit uh, that we have a new program for icebreaker manufacturers or the use of uh, uh, nuclear power generation units. It's a total replacement of the current icebreaking fleet. And Ross Adam here is one of the leaders helping us to develop the Arctic uh, offshore. Environmental safety, it's a big challenge because the Arctic as an environment is very sensitive. For me, I have some experience in that. So the environmental issues associated with the uh, oil and gas uh, systems uh, everywhere, uh, if, uh, for example, uh, those uh, uh, approaches and uh, techniques to be used there are associated with uh, the fact that we'll be um, working in the conditions uh, when the restoration might take many, many years, and not years, decades. So we should be very careful to exclude any emergencies. Uh, you might have seen uh, Star Trek films, and we are trying to step very carefully uh, about drilling. We are capable of handling uh, various emergencies. Uh, we did some pilot testing, very interesting. And the second target uh, we are approaching a major pollution is ice pollution in the Arctic. Are there any uh, methods to collect 
uh, oil from uh, the surface of ice. No one knows. And uh, Ross Atom, for example, developed a special laser system where we first evaporate ice and then bring in warm. And in this way, we will be in a position to recalculate uh, ice cover both in the offshore areas and uh, onshore. A very interesting solution. Uh, I believe it is a unique one. Power generation, a standard solution. This is a modular uh, nuclear unit. We uh, manufactured a floating uh, nuclear modular station. We have a number of uh, underwater nuclear units. I do believe that uh, we would be able to make sure that it is used commercially a kind of on-shelf uh, system uh, to be used there. A very interesting and challenging things is uh, how to handle uh, the uh, gas which could be generated when producing oil. It's not that big amount, and it won't be. We won't be able to transport it from the offshore platforms. Uh, should we flare it, or should we convert it into power generation? Something else uh, uh, to convert it into a standard process uh, requires huge facilities. It's impossible to use in the platform, and we are about to finalize a direct conversion. I guess system transporting it into liquid uh, gas. I do believe that it could be used uh, with oil and transported you know, through one pipeline system. This is a totally uh, new solution, a unique one. I do believe that very soon we would be able to demonstrate the first sample of drug conversion of gas into liquid. Um, uh, and a uh, huge amount of uh, materials, uh, special materials, uh, separate uh, individual covers, paints, uh, sensors, which uh, Ross Adam is developing both for the outer space and the Minister of Defense, and of course uh, for uh, the uses within Ross Atom industry. So all these materials, uh, they would be part of uh, uh, the earmarked federal program called uh, Power Generation Technologies for the Arctic uh, uh, Projects. I do believe that we would be able to finalize this work towards the mid-year uh, 2015, and uh, major corporations will be using these technologies within uh, the Russian sector. We believe that part of the solutions we will be offering is a very practical one, and uh, they could be used, and they would help people and our colleagues to develop the Arctic area. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, uh, oil and gas is not the end of the story. There are other deposits, other fields, other mineral resources. I do believe that one of the common questions uh, could be, uh, for example, precious stones. So uh, Alexander Chadans, Vice President on Innovation of Alros and Director of the respective institute. I do believe that to develop precious stone fields and permafrost might be even more complicated and complex than, for example, developing oil and gas fields in the Arctic. Answering your question, of course, I tend to agree with you, uh, but in order uh, to start developing them, you need to locate them first, discover them uh, in the Arctic content. But uh, let me share with you a brief information about Autos. It is the company uh, which is uh, developing precious stones uh, fields in Yakutia and in Arakongels. 99% of precious stones there comes from uh, Al Rosa. We are aware how uh, those tubes came uh, into being, and all those fields in Russia 
were found along the river channels and this way starting from the Urals uh, and then Vilui it was discovered in the river channels uh, 50 years ago when the geologist found these fields in Yakutia they also tracked uh, river channels and they found uh, oil fields on the surface. In the 70s, geology and science progressed and we were in a position to find the fields inside the earth covered with 50 or 70 uh, meters uh, of, of required drilling and of course it was time consuming and labor consuming. Nowadays we are facing a period when there are no such resources and in order for us to find such a, a field we need to drill to a much deeper horizon. So the question how to find, how to locate, how to identify the current techniques we have uh, four exploration companies uh, within our group. Unfortunately, uh, we failed to find any new fields of this kind. It's very complicated. Uh, again, we're using uh, all kinds of uh, uh, techniques, aerial reconnaissance, uh, uh, magnet reconnaissance. Uh, unfortunately, we have to find a methodology which would provide us with an opportunity to find such a field, localize it, and then to start drilling it. Because just to drill in uh, these sites, uh, which seem to be promising, uh, first of all, it, uh, is, uh, it takes time, and uh, well, we'll have to. Uh, to do, it, it may take just dozens of years. Then it is cost inefficient, because the technology is cost inefficient, and uh, certainly it is also labor uh, intensive. So the, uh, uh, here, innovations and the geological survey uh, would allow finding or discovering a field uh, which is uh, underground and which is uh, under a thick layer of soil. So the uh, uh, area of Yakutia is very promising as regards diamonds uh, and um, because uh, well, one of our uh, Enterprises uh, is uh, operating in an Arctic zone close to the Arctic Sea coastline, and uh, it is uh, where the diamond uh, you know, bulk uh, fields. So this uh, these fields are located in um, in estuaries of rivers, and due to some geological shifts. Um, Uh, rock movement took place and the core field uh, also was shifted and washed out by water. That's what I mean. Uh, so, um, well, certainly they are wrong, these core fields, but I, I we're not sure how to find them how to identify their um, precise location. We have new programs for innovations in geology, and uh, um, these programs have been uh, being implemented, and we use new technologies and methods of both Russian and Canadian origin, and uh, it's still it's still, these works are still in progress, haven't been finalized. In just a couple of minutes to describe uh, the issues uh, in the field development, 
Uh, so standards and rates uh, which have been established in operation and design of um, open pit field uh, they were developed in the 70s, 80s of the last century, and they do not uh, allow for the Creolita zone fields, so they uh, uh, d do not take into account permafrost. And today uh, we are facing a challenge. We cannot, um, on a legal basis, we cannot um, uh, put into pro, pro, uh, put into, into practice and approve uh, innovative solutions. Um, we are seeking for the problem, but we can't because if we use old rates, uh, which do not allow for the permafrost. Uh, uh, then the angles of open pits uh, and quarries uh, will be um, much more flat than are uh, should be in uh, real life, and these are hundred thousand of uh, um, a stripping rock um, volumes and amounts. So we have a few fields uh, which are in place, uh, but uh, we cannot start developing them because uh, they are covered with about 100 thick layer of uh, uh, soil. So, but we have solutions. We know how to approach this, but still, uh, we don't have um, modern rates and standards that would uh, allow the improvement. Anyway, uh, we don't, uh, well, moving forward, and we found some ways for the, uh, for designing a national standard in a cryolite zone layer. And uh, we are now elaborating on that, and uh, we will be able soon to um, to make all the solutions that we've developed legal. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, I'm absolutely sure that we'll get back to regulations and uh, leg uh, legislative initiatives that are needed uh, as concerns the Arctic. But I would like to get back to the topic which I mentioned before, <laughs> to the scope of uh, researches and surveys which precede the development and drilling sessions. So, uh, well, here you can uh, monitor, you can see uh, in the slide, some slides related to the monitoring of the ice um, conditions and weather conditions. And for example, uh, so to, to get detailed um, uh, images of an iceberg, uh, we need to spend about three or four thousand US dollars. So uh, when we make this, uh, this uh, take these images from above. So I give the floor to Mr. Roisman. Uh, he represents Intel Partner Company. He's a developer of the dwarf underground um, uh, cameras. Um, he was awarded uh, a golden medal at the exhibition uh, Eureka. So how does it look like your dwarf? or gnome in Russian. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I represent a product of a small innovative business. It was initiated uh, in the in early 2000s. Uh, by our company, and not only the director of Intel partner, but also head of uh, the laboratory for the uh, underground, for the underwater equipment in the uh, Institute of Oceanology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Starting from the early 2000s, so we work uh, on the design of a miniature um, camera or no, apparatus, and uh, you, you can see them actually in the uh, development booth and in Skolkovo. Uh, so our development um, was progressing in the following manner. First, we tested it uh, uh, on the Baikal uh, and the, uh, during the environmental expedition of the Ministry of Emergence, and uh, where we tr uh, were uh, searching for uh, the uh, erect uh, ships 
in the Baikal. So it, uh, so uh, um, this was uh, um, kind of a replacement of uh, uh, diving work, and there, uh, f you know, it is. Um, uh, a very cost inefficient, you know, to hire divers in this case. Uh, so uh, after uh, uh, some 12 or 13 years of improvement, uh, this uh, equipment is supplied to 40 countries of the world. We have seven models, and they are used uh, in uh, the Arctic as well. So we use together with the Ministry of Emergencies uh, in the area of monitoring of radiation, of, uh, um, of uh, spent uh, nuclear fuel container in the Nova Zemlya. Uh, and, uh, so we have special equipment, special operators uh, that searches such containers or some burying places of these containers, and the gamma spectrometer, uh, which is uh, uh, fitted to it, uh, measures radiation in this area. And it is a unique complex, and uh, uh, it is very small and uh, in size, and there's no need to use heavy machinery on lo and large vessels. So we can uh, work with a motorboat with it uh, and uh, get down to about 200 meter depth. And together with the Kurchatov uh, Research Center, we are modifying our apparatus, and it we I used it in the Sokompola area for scientific research there we used a special sensor there to measure uh, to measure solar light uh, penetration through ice through the thickness of ice and it can be also uh, used in the expeditions of the Russian Academy of Science uh, which deal with uh, methane uh, penetration and uh, it is also extensively used by the Ministry of uh, uh, Emergencies and Rescue Operations. So, uh, so we modified uh, this uh, uh, apparatus for the circumpolar uh, area use, and the Institute of, Ar of the Arctic and Antarctic uh, uh, um, uh, just uh, used uh, our dwarf uh, to. Uh, to track the movement of two big ice platforms. Uh, it was related with the Rosneft uh, uh, offshore platform uh, construction. Uh, so uh, everything what we have uh, uh, is on the global level and even maybe above it. And this um, um, allows us to, um, and uh, it was funded from our own funds. Uh, from sales of this uh, apparatus, uh, plus some subsidies of uh, some uh, uh, Botex fund. And uh, we also use some funds from the Ministry of Science. So this, the pr promotion of uh, this um, apparatus brought him glory, actually. It has become famous in the world. And we have uh, orders uh, which are, are not worse than our French and American competitors. So in Skolkovo, you can see in the exhibition call, you can see the separators uh, with the uh, results, actually, images that have been taken uh, underwater. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boris. And uh, I'm happy that we touched upon the uh, topic of science, which is, uh, which is critical, actually, for the Arctic development and exploration. And uh, to this end, I would like to invite Anatoly Zalatuhin, uh, who is the scientific head of the um, uh, chair of the oil and gas uh, field development in the oil and gas uh, university named after Gupkin. I read your last uh, comments in Russian media, and I would like to give you a title of the most active experts um, who uh, actually encouraged and welcomed um, the uh, car IC investigations uh, which have been undertaken together by Russian and American researchers. Are you ready to de develop the Arctic? So good afternoon, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for giving me a chance 
uh, to give a talk here. Well, this is a very good question, and it's rather hard to give a, a very short answer to it. On the one hand, we are ready to that, but uh, uh, it's not as simple as that. And uh, we had a forum on the non-traditional alternative reserves, and one of them said that it is a piece of cake. No, it is not a piece of cake, and uh, we need to slowly uh, move forward and work thoroughly because to make a Mercedes, you need to do everything every day. Designers should work well at each component and so on and so forth. So the Arctic won't forgive our mistakes. And Mr. Chilingarev, who is here with us today, knows it better than the others, and he was awarded a lot of just honorary science for that. And uh, there is, uh, well, you should, we should be very cautious with the Arctic and uh, think a lot and uh, uh, move forward stepwise and uh, wait sometimes even. So the same when we deal with uh, specific uh, technology. So if we look at the Arctic shelf, then uh, we see if it is accessible or not, uh, well, in terms of the existing technologies, environmental and technological issues, and the mentality, uh, strange as it may seem. So, and uh, it appears that about 90 percent of the Arctic Shelf area uh, should be developed very cautiously. Only 10 percent uh, we have good uh, knowledge, uh, of which we have good knowledge, and uh, for which we have appropriate technologies and equipment. And 90 percent fall to the unknown um, and unexplored category. We should be ready for that, and uh, and we should get prepared for that. So we start. Uh, we should start our work right right away, but shouldn't. A hurry, because the future of the international Arctic, not only the Russian Arctic, uh, we all show you uh, will manifest itself only in the second part of the 21st century. First, we need, uh, well, just uh, first of all, to uh, raise uh, the rate of develop of uh, exploration and development, uh, which starts uh, from the year of 2019. It is not only our opinion, but of some international uh, agencies. And uh, in our assessments, we use not only Russian databases and packages, but also international uh, databases. Uh, and this is our meeting point. I would like to show a few slides just uh, one by one quickly, please. Let's choose uh, number 11. It is a geological map. Uh, uh, the, uh, it was done by the United States Geological Survey Agency. Oh, I disappeared. Can I do it myself? Okay. Thank you. Here it is. So green shows the most promising area in the North Hemisphere sphere in the circumpolar region. This is Alaska, north of Alaska, and on the left and uh, from the top to the uh, to the bottom, this is the Russian area, and it is the most promising as uh, recognized even by our American competitors. Uh, here you can see gas resources, and they are huge in Russia, as you can see. So uh, oil production is a challenge, and gas production is easier. So uh, the well, uh, oil rate, uh, uh, well, is a uh, term that is used for oil production, but they don't use it for gas. So, and uh, so, and uh, uh, so we produce only one sort of oil resources, and um, uh, we are rich in gas. And, and here, the hydrocarbon production will be uh, in percent higher than in other countries because we are more rich in gas than they. So this is our assessment, and uh, it bases on the current, uh, currently available data. So there's producible resources, recoverable resources of the Arctic shelf on the global level. So Russia ranks first here, so it is given in the billions of uh, uh, 
Uh, so you should, if you want it in barrels, then you should multiply by 2.8. So uh, Norway, 4, Greenland, Denmark, uh, um, 7, and uh, Canada, 4, and the United States, Alaska, 7 billion tons of the oil equivalent, or 50 billion barrels. Uh, so 64 of the whole uh, falls uh, to the Russian area. So that's what we know and what we can. And we, uh, there is quite a lot of uh, uh, information that is not, uh, which is still uh, unavailable. So, uh, so the north of the Caspian Sea also falls to the um, uh, promising oil production area. In winter, they are just uh, the temperature is about minus 20 here. And the Caspian Sea, uh, then uh, the Russian Far East, uh, um, about uh, well, is the potential high? It is 50 or 60 percent uh, uh, satisfaction of the demand in the um, APR region uh, in the uh, Asian Pacific region. So, so red is land and uh, blue uh, is uh, sea. So, this uh, you can see the figures which are absolutely real. So different seas and currency and barren sea. So uh, oh, oh, just how about the total production? So by the year 2040, these are the amounts which can be produced in the Russian Arctic and million tons of oil equivalent, about 190 million of oil in oil equivalent. Uh, so, uh, so 1.5 billion certainly would fall to the Arctic. It's um, about 30, uh, more than 30 percent of the overall production instead of 15, 20. Uh, so this is uh, the um, potential, our potential. What should we do to produce this uh, reserve? So we need uh, public uh, governmental programs for that, not just ideas. They have, we have brilliant ideas, but uh, there is n uh, nothing be be behind them, no technology of decision making that would support these ideas. So uh, they fail, and the society just uh, just is, uh, uh, listens to these ideas uh, like they listen to an act in the theater, so and nothing more. So we should hurry up. We shouldn't hurry up with the development of the Arctic, but we need to do our job every day. Otherwise, we would fail. So what investments are needed for the Arctic development um, into the de different survey uh, uh, operations? We need about uh, a trillion of American dollars. So there's huge money, and so certainly Russian alone won't, uh, would be uh, quite it um, in a challenge to do this. So if uh, Russia alone uh, would face quite a challenge in that, we need an international partnership. And here we see uh, just um, a huge cluster of issues uh, of international cooperation. So who can be a partner of Russia just in terms of the sanctions? Uh, uh, it, should I take this question? OK, OK. But uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to say that we need to be smart diplomats uh, and decent diplomats to uh, to have an open dialogue with the countries we are interested in. We uh, ask our uh, diplomats, uh, who, uh, what is a diplomacy? Who is a diplomat? People get confused. They don't know. They haven't given a thought to it. This is just a, diplomacy is a job done by a diplomat. It's, and I would like to quote on all diplomats, retired diplomats, a lot of diplomats says the art to live at the expense of your neighbors and neighbors should be absolutely happy with that uh, so, so yes so the art of living at the expense of the neighbors uh, all, all this has been uh, assimilated by a lot of countries but uh, to have the neighbors uh, happy with that then that's another um, way around and not many countries know how to do this so we should uh, uh, be highly respected by the world uh, global community and we need good Partners. So, who could be our uh, decent uh, uh, partners in this? First of all, Norway. Uh, why? Be uh, well, it is our weight opinion. Uh, 
I've worked and uh, been a professor of Stavanger University in Norway for more than 20 years already. And I also work in Spitsbergen. Um, I have been there, I have been working there for 20 years. And I uh, was uh, in uh, with Statoil for 10 years. So I know uh, well, the psychology of Norwegians very well. So this is a nation which we, uh, from which we may learn quite a lot of lessons. They won't sell um, uh, fish uh, for oil. Um, for fishery uh, is the most uh, the, key, the key industry for them because it dates back to 1,000 years. So they say that oil is a temporary uh, event of their life, and uh, so certainly a preference always is given to fish, and uh, uh, this is uh, in terms of environmental pollution. And uh, they are uh, very very uh, careful with uh, um, nature protection actions, and uh, I think that uh, well, just uh, these are. You know, culture um, and mentality uh, should be taught to kids from the early age. And uh, if we can confirm this by our deeds, not only words, and we'll have a lot of successes. So sometimes we listen to lectures on the environmental protection. Well, and a person who uh, well just gives this talk is smoking, you know, and then he just throws down this, uh, um, uh, you know, just the uh, cigarette and uh, continue in, in the break and then continues his lecturing. So nobody would believe him because he says, uh, says one and uh, uh, does the other thing. So nobody would do this in Norway. And it's absolutely clean in this country. And looking uh, at our streets, at our bus stops, and how people, you know, what threw out an ash train to the street. Um, so, well, um, so is it a care? of the environment. This is how we care for it. So we should uh, bring up people, you know, just in this culture. Thank you very much. I'm so happy that you mentioned that an ideal partner is Norway. We have here our uh, Norwegian speaker, and I want uh, to give him the floor. Come, you, Harold. Uh, and let me get it absolutely straight. So how can you evaluate the current um, partnership between Russia and Norway, especially taking into consideration the latest portion of sanctions that was faced to, towards Russia? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just take off this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Norway and Russia has uh, cooperated for very, very many years, uh, especially on the border in the north. And there is a very much people-to-people uh, -people cooperation. And uh, this year, it is 17 years since uh, Russia liberated the country of Finnmark in northern Norway. And uh, Lavrov is coming to Finnmark next week, and uh, we want to cooperate with Russia. Then, unfortunately, there has been these sanctions, and uh, hopefully this will uh, go um, disappear so we can uh, uh, continue cooperating. And I think it's very, very important, and I think it's very important that we can develop a common infrastructure. Uh, we need infrastructure in the north, and we need to work together because of the long distance. Uh, we also, from a Norwegian point of view, we want a common development on both sides of the border in the north. That means in Kirkenes, on the Norwegian side, and also on the Russian side, perhaps Peshenga Fjord. Uh, that is, then we can have the joint resources. Oh, thank you. Mm. So you see future perspectives for the partnership between Norway and Russia, even taking into consideration the current sanctions problem? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I mean, when it comes to the 
Norwegian people and the Russian people, we are the same people. And, uh, and uh, we can, of course, work together. And uh, from our point of view, we want the Arctic to be an area for international cooperation. I mean, there is so many resources in the Arctic that we should work together. And then we are in a situation where gas it is meeting uh, uh, minerals and we get a new platform for industrial development in the north and we don't need just to be a uh, producer of raw materials that we have been for a long time. We could also, with the gas, with the surplus gas, we could also get new platforms for, uh, for development. So I do not think we should be so pessimistic. I think we should be more optimistic and work together. I mean, that's it's the situation. And uh, we shouldn't emphasize too much what you call the diplomats and what the diplomats are doing. <laughs> so this is uh, my point of view as a native of North Norway. Thank you. Ну, я очень рада, что мы пришли к единому такому норвежско-российскому компромиссу. Право некого такого заключительного или промежуточного заключительного слова хочу предоставить легендарному. I want to provide a concluding part of our discussion. A legend of Russian Arctic, a well-known, famous Arctic explorer, oceanologist, a special representative of international cooperation for Russian presidents member of the board of directors of Rosneft. Uh, I do believe that these are but a few major titles. So, what is so important about the Arctic that uh, the government, the state, companies want to invest huge amounts of money to develop? Thank you very much uh, for the organizers of the forum uh, to select this topic for discussion, developing Arctic resources complexes and uh, challenges. Uh, this is a really topical and relevant term. I want to say that when you open the session uh, that Arctic development is a complex or as challenging as the outer space exploration, I would say that uh, there is a difference uh, between the Arctic development and outer space exploration. Outer space is interesting, uh, risky, uh, but uh, we don't know when there will be practical results from the outer space exploration. Uh, we have something. We are talking about the cost, we are talking about the aerial, uh, but when you invest in the Arctic development, as mentioned by uh, our colleague Anatoly Zakokhin, uh, that by uh, this year we will have practical results. In, you invest and then you get returns in your investments because you've got various mineral resources. Nickel or uh, gold, this is a noble challenge. We need to focus it and we need to have a plan. Yes, this is a complex uh, task. Now, I would like to share with you some of uh, the problems raised by my colleagues. Alrosa, I do believe I know this company I've been to Yakutia many times. Uh, they've been using all kinds of innovation, new technologies. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that uh, they decided to explore underground, deep into the earth. There are mines, and this is all in the Arctic already, but on shore. Very complicated and complex uh, climate conditions. Um, any solution you are looking for is a breakthrough. Uh, for the first time in many decades, uh, Russia now has a uh, nuclear or atomic icebreakers which could travel, which would move all around Arctic at any period, at any seasons. And we are now building a new uh, nuclear or atomic icebreakers, new generation of these vessels, and this is all related to environmental safety. 
uh, underground devices, vessels, unique solutions, innovative breakthrough. Uh, what I suggest you do is as follows. We've been uh, trying to locate uh, the Crescent Icebreaker, which uh, was destroyed during uh, World War II, and the Russian Geographical Society uh, is trying to raise it. And I invite you into this project because uh, this is going to be a very patriotic um, uh, project. A geologist contributed a lot for the exploration of mineral resources. Logistics, we're talking about uh, the Pabeda platform uh, together with Mr. Sitchin. We need academicians there. We need research results. Uh, uh, one of the biggest companies in the world, uh, Rosneft, decided a week ago, I proposed it, to establish a subcommittee for Arctic research. And this is the way we need to handle the situation. And they're aware that without research, without the science, it's not possible to operate in the Arctic because this is a very sensitive area. And the fact that a company and many other companies are concerned about environmental safety is a very good positive sign. Uh, there are more than a dozen emergency companies there using new breakthrough technologies to help to manage potential emergencies. And I'm uh, very happy that we are discussing this theme and we are open to invite, to embrace uh, breakthrough technologies. Thank you very much. So, quickly, questions, if uh, possible. The mic. I would like to congratulate our Norwegian uh, friends uh, uh, to establish a drifting power station. There are a couple of people uh, which are there, and we are always uh, ready to help. I'd like uh, to. To, to touch base on a correction uh, uh, because I'm representing a journal about the Arctic and it was the academician who mentioned the fact that to develop Arctic is a much more challenging thing uh, or even as challenging as uh, exploring the space. I remember when there were a lot of discussions about the architect development when our journal raised this issue and, for example, there was a theme associated with a legacy uh, of, for example, Ministry of Defense machinery which uh, left all us uh, in Arctic. Now, what about the political situation? I mean, the question to you. You're double-heading. You're thinking about future, and at the same time, you're uh, thinking about your own homeland. For example, the thing about Norwegian. Uh, some of the scholars and the scientists, uh, they come and work in Norway. Uh, I'm always for international cooperation in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, we had a joint flight to our base. It was last year. Our North Pole, all the um, uh, um, ambassadors of uh, the countries in the circumpolar. And we supported all international projects and programs. And we are very proactive, and we are happy to have a representative of Norway here. We are open in uh, uh, everything which concerns Arctic research. Uh, on the other hand, our military presence. Our Ministry of Defense have always been there. We are very proactive in cleaning up 
uh, of the waste uh, from uh, former military prisons. Uh, there is a different challenge now. We have a boundary, we have a military zone. There are some structures which are trying to identify various uh, vessels which might pose a risk uh, for the border. I do believe that uh, we will be supporting in future our international cooperation and your proposals will be supported uh, in any case. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, <laughs> for and of course, uh, uh, Norway and Russia has a lot of uh, areas where we could cooperate and that we have cooperated. We are cooperating in Svalbard, in Spitsbergen. Uh, we are neighbors and uh, I really hope that we can work in many areas. And I am very much uh, looking forward to the international uh, cooperation in the Arctic. And of course, we must, as neighbor, cooperate. I mean, that's, uh, we must. <laughs> that's essential. One more question. Uh, this is a business incubator. We have our own uh, Arctic experience. We've uh, done a bidding uh, how to live in the Arctic. Technologies, warmth, uh, waste treatment, clean water, things like that. The uh, competition turned out to be an extremely intriguing and interesting. And on the 23rd of October, we will present uh, our results. There was 172 competitors. I would like to make a proposal. Uh, we expected that uh, our Finnish friends and Norwegian friends uh, would also um, be there, but uh, there was a hint that it's not high time to participate. And I do believe that politics is politics and cooperation is cooperation. Uh, free of any political hurdles. Well, just to ask this question, uh, do people really want to live in the Arctic or maybe we would have a rotational camps there? Uh, I mean, this, the, the tower shape I saw, it shocked me. I saw a swimming pool, Olympic size. Uh, I saw a gas field camp. 45% of the population is independent, and 33% of the community budget comes from them. I mean, I was shocked beyond belief. Uh, Anatoly came from uh, Spitsbergen. Uh, there is a university there. Students come to stay there from all over the world. But believe you need to be very cautious. Can I ask you questions? Uh, Nikolai, professor from Fistech, and I uh, manage several laboratories. We, I mean, there is a project to establish a research center in Spitsbergen. There is a resolution of the government. I know, I know. Your point of view of this center its objectives and goals, uh, would it play a big role in the research in Arctic? Uh, one of the major objectives of this research center is to be part of the hydrometeorological. There'll be a slightly different system of training, but I do believe uh, the academician institutions are very proactive. Uh, this is a center engaged in the uh, studies of the areas adjacent to this. Uh, University of Spitsbergen. Uh, also monitoring, because it used to carry out monitoring activities there, hydrometeorological and others. There are 
research projects to be supported by the Academy of Sciences in December. There will be a plenary meeting of the Academy of Sciences of Russia, and that would be one of the topics to be discussed there. We made decisions. I visited the Spitsbergen area as part of the governmental commission. I hope that we'll be using all possible opportunities to make sure that our scars will be working there. We will be using Spitsbergen together support our base in Borneo. Thank you. Ecograd Journal. I'm not going to hurt anyone here, so my question here would be as follows. You can ask anyone this question. We will be having more common questions. <coughs> A bit of a queer question. <coughs> non ethnic countries, there are many of them. Uh, Brazil, India, Singapore. <laughs> uh, they're very much interested uh, in the Arctic uh, topic. I would like to limit myself to Brazil and India. For example, the Brazil uh, air industry is much more developed than the Russian air uh, uh, industry. Uh, for example, could Russia cooperate with such unexpected partners with uh, regard to the Arctic development? Because I'm uh, supportive to the rotational camp method of development. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, aviation techniques. We used to have good machines where you could uh, a uh, fly to Arctic that was Il-14 or Il-2, which used skis, and they could use uh, landing sites. Together with the Ministry of Defense, we are developing an aircraft which could use uh, skis, R-14, very proactive in trying to master the Russian territory. It's a small uh, aircraft, I do believe that we will be able um, to get it this year. It's a breakthrough based on uh, the respective uh, decisions of the government. Uh, without aviation, it won't be possible for us to develop uh, the Arctic. I had a special program uh, actually to duplicate uh, the uh, Nobel expedition using uh, a special aircraft, uh, but uh, I failed. In any case, I do believe that those countries which are interested in uh, uh, developing the Arctic, we have, for example, five or seven Arctic uh, countries, and there are observer countries. India is one of them. So Singapore is an observer. Singapore has an ambassador for Arctic. China. On especially active for China is. And for us to uh, provide competition here, we need to develop our innovation projects, new projects. Uh, new projects which is related to uh, the Arctic, and we would certainly welcome and encourage it. Rosneft, and um, I'm now out of uh, politics, and I put to, to the uh, board of directors of Rosneft and responsible for all Arctic projects. So we uh, set up a subcommittee there for Arctic R&D. So uh, it could serve as a model for other companies, because we cannot do without uh, research and uh, it is represented by different experts, engineers, and academics. So we're uh, starting from the forecasting uh, of navigation in the um, 
um, Arctic Ocean, without the navigation and geographical researches there. So we cannot do without this, and we cannot uh, explore and develop the Arctic uh, in an uh, uh, environmentally sustainable way. Uh, so let's uh, discuss uh, just China or Brazil, uh, just role here. So China, uh, so 12 countries are um, Apart to the additional committee, they are not in the Arctic Committee, but in the Arctic Council. Uh, China, South Korea, they, all these countries have their stations in the Arctic and uh, in the Antarctic. Excuse me. Uh, so I was in New Orleans on uh, Spitsbergen. Uh, this is a small village with a population of 50 people, and there is a boss of this village. He called a boss, and he is responsible for the number of. Uh, Males and males there, so 25 men and 25 women live there. Or well, actually, all the nations are represented there, for the exception of which Russia. So we need uh, our presence there. It is a very small place uh, where the international uh, cooperation will expand uh, greatly because uh, they won't be able to uh, to, uh, to go without um, uh, you know just without outsiders there. And you know, our practice uh, in uh, the university, the Gupkin University, um, we practice a lot of cooperation with um, uh, foreign universities. We have no enemies uh, in the world. We send our students to the best uh, universities of the world. And uh, as said, one of the prof Swedish professors said that our cooperation would never cease. Uh, they, uh, they can cease only if I die or we'll have a war between our two countries. So so, and and one more comment on the comparison between uh, the outer space and Arctic. Uh, here's an example. Yes, the Arctic is more uh, difficult. You know, it's more challenging to explore it. So uh, we had uh, about uh, 100 astronauts, but only one Chiling uh, only one man, Chilingarev, was uh, in deep uh, deep Arctic. About Brazil, it is uh, uh, really active in the Antarctic. I know it very well, but I haven't heard about the Arctic. You know what? Um, it's Antarctic. China, India, and Brazil, South America, South Korea. Well, there are quite a lot of questions. Let's finish with this, too, first of all. Uh, good, good afternoon. Andrea Skop, I represent in our GmbH Germany. We have our office in Russia, and we uh, I listened to Mr. Chilingarov uh, about VVA 14, and we develop multi-mode uh, screen flyer. So it is a very comprehensive, comprehensive vehicle. Um, it is a um, state-of-the-art vehicle, and we focus on the Arctic for our uh, vehicles uh, to be used there. So it, why is it so difficult to promote our screen, um, you know, screen flyers? So, uh, but I heard that uh, uh, somewhere um, refueling stations being built on the Arctic for helicopters, and we can use it for our vehicles as well. So uh, is it true? And the second part of the question is, how long should we use uh, MI-8? There are quite a lot of crushes of these uh, helicopters. So those screen flyers, uh, uh, well, it's just quite a lot of talk about that, a lot of rumors. But um, we haven't actually seen them. We, we use the military planes there. And, um, uh, well, Alexeyev's company also produced the screen planes. Uh, so, uh, well, I would, you know, test it, uh, t test it myself it, uh, if it be able to reach uh, the northern pole. Um, but I haven't tried it. I haven't seen this screen plane. Um, well, 10 years ago, uh, on board of AN2, we reached um, the... Uh, southern Pole, but not back, certainly. Well, uh, so 
we need uh, aviation aircraft that would be able to uh, to fly and to land on these skis like Hercules in the United States, um, which let us address a lot of issues in the Antarctic. So where are your proposals? Go ahead. Only ideas, you know, and concepts. Nothing actually flew. Okay, you should discuss this individual as and well face to face. And one comment about MI8 helicopters, which are used in the Arctic mostly. So this, uh, I wouldn't say that they are not safe. Uh, so we've been using it for a long time, uh, and we are using now a new version with a new engine, and they are absolutely reliable, especially uh, useful for geologists. And I don't think that we're able to find uh, another helicopter um, for such missions, well, in the world. So MIH, uh, me and the and uh, with a team um, uh, reached the southern pole. We had two helicopters, MI-8. Uh, is there any other helicopter in the world that would uh, do the same uh, way to the southern pole? pole and it operates at minus 60 centigrade. So it was tested in very harsh conditions. So this green plane, those green flies, certainly is a new thing and maybe it would be uh, more cost efficient, but we need to test it first of all and then uh, uh, we should calculate, you know, the money and uh, everyone would all for that if, uh, if it is efficient uh, for the development of the Arctic. Now, after, I think that after our panel you will discuss this uh, um, and elaborate on that. So, good afternoon, Anton Malinovsky, the Transfer Technologies Network. So, a question to Anatoly and maybe his colleagues, but primarily to him. So, actually, all the presenters discussed technologies of the Arctic development, and you said that, uh, and you showed your, uh, these overheads that prove the benefits of that. So, and also technology for life in the Arctic also were mentioned. What, in, uh, well, to your mind, who could be uh, a customer of such technologies, business, or again, the responsibility, it's a responsibility and burden of the government? Well, absolutely. So it's uh, not easy to get given an answer to it. Certainly, business should be a customer here, but if business builds uh, on the platform of governmental interests, so because business's um, objective is um, to maximize to get maximize profits. So very often they act illegally, but we need to you know certain boundaries and business should work within them. So if interests coincide with public interest, then uh, all uh, objectives will be attained. Uh, well, so large companies could be customers such as Rosneft, Gazprom, Gazprom Neft, Lukoil, and other oil and gas companies and servicing companies. Um, they can uh, create climate uh, and uh, reliable conditions uh, that would, uh, you know, just make your life safe in the Arctic because there's quite a lot of risk uh, associated with the Arctic development. Uh, 1980, uh, 1870s, uh, Franklin's expedition to Arctic was prepared very well and with a three-year um, uh, they, they had food and water for the three-year period, but nobody got returned back. And Norwegian go a ship, a light ship, uh, in 1911 reached the uh, southern pole, but not the northern. So mentality also should be altered. So the interest should be focused uh, in one direction for business and the society and communities should work together, uh, include. Uh, uh, just and I would like to include here science and university. So American, in terms of the energy policy, one and they have be, uh, as a result they have become uh, independent in that. Uh, so uh, certainly uh, is a very good example. You know, shale oil and gas is not as efficient uh, as that. Uh, it's cost uh, uh, inefficient and uh, it needs loans and so on. But we see the effect. 
and place. So we need to do the same, not just to suggest some ideas, but to show our implementation mechanisms. And uh, uh, that, that was a very good question. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, recent years, uh, the uh, leadership of uh, the government gives a lot of support to all initiatives in the Arctic. Certainly, uh, Russia should work a lot in the Arctic, and uh, so it is also an outer border um, which passes through the Arctic shelf. Well, a lot of success, uh, um, success here, uh, first of all, as regards the Okhotsk Sea and uh, uh, there used to be a period where we didn't work with the Arctic, so we uh, managed to preserve the um, nuclear fleet uh, and the system related to where uh, the provisional work uh, in in the North Arctic is including the use of uh, special northern aircraft and also uh, underwater researches. Uh, so now we are happy that there is still an interest to the Arctic and there are people who are uh, advocates of that. And it's Russian pride. So okay, the last question, because we are running short of time, we should wrap up. We should move fast. Andrei Shukin, uh, portal peritalk.ru. Uh, so Alexander, well, could you elaborate on some energy projects in the Arctic? Uh, what equipment will be used uh, there? Will be there mobile or stationary? Do you have some hubs already uh, ready for that? Uh, the Arctic already hosts some uh, nuclear plants. Uh, uh, Microgenerators have been installed in, in a few gulfs. Uh, this is certainly a def defense objective. And uh, believe in nuclear plant, uh, which will be operating in the Arctic conditions. We have icebreakers, submarines, and uh, uh, it's all in place uh, uh, and an operation. And um, it, uh, well, yesterday I was in uh, St. Petersburg and I already gave a talk on the uh, on the nuclear energy. And uh, uh, there was made a decision that we will develop uh, a series of small module nuclear reactors. Uh, first of all, for the uh, for insurance of life. Uh, uh, on platforms, uh, bases, and uh, some villages in the Arctic. If, uh, if uh, we see gas and oil and associated gas, then we we'll certainly can use all these resources. But in the preparation stage, these uh, you know, plants are unique. So we have a three product, uh, a three component uh, uh, line. So below one megawatt, uh, from five to 20 megawatts, from 20 to 100 and 300 megawatts, but uh, and above which is not suitable for the Arctic. So in the Arctic, we use the such plants with below 300 megawatts, and they have about five, six prototypes. Uh, they are uh, well, some of them are ready uh, to be used, some of them not. But uh, we can be absolutely sure that for the de deadlines that were set today, uh, uh, for the year after 200. So I think that we will be able to, um, you know, to be ready by that time. And this is an absolutely realistic deadline for us. And the icebreakers will be built, and uh, we will propose some specific technological solutions and a special building blocks uh, for. We will restore our military bases, which are being restored now on the shelf and uh, on the uh, uh, land uh, and. You said on the shelf. No, not on the shelf. On land. I'm, excuse me. Uh, so, but it is uh, Arctic anyway. So, uh, well, I'm sorry to say that the time is. Uh, over this panel is to be closed and absolutely sure that all uh, who are present here today uh, uh, would like the Arctic to be a catalyst of oil gas industry and uh, plus uh, would bring benefits to the Russian economy uh, in uh, at large. Thank you for your the discussion.